This is how you make your Daz Studio hair assets look good in Blender. First, make sure you use a hair asset made up of static planes. This means that the hair is made up of individual strips of mesh, which makes use of an alpha map texture to give the illusion that the hair is made up of individual strands. This is in comparison to default strand-based hair, which is designed to mimic real hair and also work with Daz Studio's simulation engine. Unfortunately, strand-based hair comes with a big performance cost, which makes it a massive headache to use in Blender, which is why I recommend using static plane-based hair instead. First, we need to pick our hair. For this tutorial, I'll be using the side-parted long bob hair for Genesis 9. This hair asset comes with many options, including hairstyle presets and sliders. Now after you have stylized your hair, we need to import it into Blender using, you've guessed it, Diffeomorphic. For this tutorial, the character which I will be using is actually going to be the focus of two other videos on the global skin add-on, so subscribe to not miss out. Now once imported, focus in on your hair. Create a new collection in your outliner. Name it Hair. Then drag your hair object from the character's rig to the new collection. Next, with your hair object selected, go to Edit Mode and Separate by Material. This will break the hair into separate pieces. This usually includes the hair cap, the main hair mesh, and some loose strands. Remerge the loose strands and the main hair piece. Then rename the separate objects to cap and mesh. I would also rename the vertex data as well. Now let's fix the hair texture. The main problem with transferring hair materials from Daz Studio to Blender is that Daz's hair materials are designed to work with Daz Studio's lighting engine and not Blender's cycles engine. So to fix this, I created my own custom Daz hair material, which you can use to swap out any Daz hair material which has been imported into Blender. If you want it, it's currently for sale on my Patreon and Gumroad. I would also like to take a moment to thank everyone who has already purchased my hair asset. It is truly great to see people support my channel. Thank you. When you download it, you will get a PDF with instructions on how to use it. But I'll save you some time and tell you. In the blend file, you'll get an example and a material cube. Copy that cube into your scene, or you can create a material asset for quick access. Next, select your original Daz Her material and find its alpha map. Copy its file name. Then swap out the original Daz Her material with Avian's Daz BSDF Her. When you swap out the material, the hair will look a little strange. This is because the wrong alpha map is applied. Go into shader mode, find the alpha texture node, and paste the name of the original alpha texture which we copied into the search bar. You will see that the hair now looks correct. In the light path settings, make sure the transparent value is set to a high value. Otherwise, you will see black spots in your hair where light can't pass through. This will decrease performance, so be selective on when you increase these values. I would also increase the viewport sample rate to a high value, so you can see a cleaner result. Next, in the compositor, add in the Korohara painterly filter node. In the Cycles drop-down menu, set the real-time compositor to Always. Set the Korohara node to Anisotropic and play around with the values until you get the result you like. You could also add in an anti-aliasing node to smooth over any rough edges. Turn off real-time compositing when you're done to avoid any performance issues. Next, go to the Outliner, right-click on your character's collection, and select All. Click on one of the character objects, then deselect the subdivision modifier. Right-click on that deselected button, and select Copy to Selected. This will make your character low-poly in the viewport. This camera icon means that the modifier will be activated when you render. Now, let's dive into my hair material. First, in the node tree, you'll see several framed groups. You can use these to change how your hair looks. To edit the alpha texture, connect the hard or soft alpha color ramp control into this input. This will allow you to fine tune how hard or soft the alpha texture is. Optionally, the smooth alpha color mix node allows for another alpha texture to be overlaid on top of your original alpha to get a different look. You can also connect the color ramp to make extra adjustments. Feel free to replace this texture and experiment for different results. 
but this is not really necessary as the alpha texture by itself will do the job well enough. Control hair color lets you adjust the hair's natural color so it can be either blonde, brunette, or ginger. If you connect the color override node, you'll be able to dye the hair to any color combination you wish. The shine node lets you adjust the intensity of the hair's shine. The shine's color can be independent of the hair's color node, or you can connect this node to override it. For this project, I chose to go with a brunette. To get this, I adjusted the hue saturation node so the hair changed to a deep brown. Now let's take a look at the hair cap. This is an underlayer used to prevent the character's scalp from being visible. The problem you can often have is that the cap's mesh does not often match with your character's head, which can lead to clipping. To fix this, we need to remove the subdivision modifiers for the hair cap. This will make the hair cap low poly, which will fix the poke through, as the bends in the mesh will prevent clipping with the high poly head. Next, we need to make the hair cap less reflective. In the shader editor, delete all the nodes so we just have the alpha and color texture map. Then reduce the roughness and specular values. You can then add in a hue saturation node and adjust its values so you have a darker version of your hair color. Now we have finished applying the hair material. Make sure to do a final compositing check to ensure your hair looks good. Let's weight paint our hair. Select the armature, then select the hair object. Go to object mode and change it to weight paint mode. If you hold alt and select the bones, you will see that the armature is applying weight paint to the hair. We don't want this, so in object mode, select the hair and go to the data tab. In vertex groups, you will see all the bones applying weight paint to your hair. Right now, we don't need any of this, so go to this drop down menu and select delete all groups. This will wipe all the weight paint from the hair. Some hair assets may have their own bone sets. These can be found in the bone collections, usually in the custom layers. If you want to remove weight paint from the character's armature, but preserve weight paint from these bones, then in the vertex groups, lock all the bones which have the weight paint you want to protect. Click the drop down menu, but this time, select delete all unlocked groups. Make sure to unlock the vertex groups when you're done, as they will prevent you from editing the weight paint. As we'll be rigging the hair, we won't be needing these bones, so with the armature selected, go to edit mode and delete them. Make sure not to accidentally delete any other bones in the custom bones layer. Now, let's start rigging. First, we need to create an anchor bone for the hair. I do this by snapping the cursor to the upper neck bone. I then go up to add single bone. It will come in quite long. Select the tip at the top of the bone and bring it down, so it's the same height as the upper neck bone. Now select the anchor bone and then select the neck bone. Parent, make, keep offset. Now let's anchor the hair to the anchor bone. Select the anchor bone and then go to weights. Select set weights or press control X. Now the anchor bone has control over the entire hair. This is useful if you want to flip the hair so it's parted in the opposite direction. You will also need to flip the hair cap as well by using the scale X value. This can cause clipping, so add a few extra points to that value to remove it. For better visibility, select the anchor bone and go to the bone data tab. Open the viewport display menu and set the bone color to red. This will help us see what we're doing more clearly. Next, select the anchor bone and duplicate it. Move this bone over to the side and stretch it out so it's the length of the hair. Make sure the dotted parent line is at the top. Position this bone so it aligns with a section of the hair. In this instance, this bone is covering the fringe. Once in position, duplicate that bone and move it to a new section. Repeat this process until all the angles of the hair have a bone. When you're done, make sure all the hair bones are parented to the anchor bone. If you want to hide these new bones so we have less visual clutter, then in pose mode go to the bone collection tab. Press the plus button to create a new bone layer, and then select all the bones you have created and assign them to that layer. Now, before we start weight painting, hide all the bone collections except for the hair, as we will have a less cluttered UI to work with. Now we can start weight painting. First, as a tip, if you want to weight paint a certain section of the hair without affecting the rest, you'll need to separate it so it becomes its own object. To do this, in edit mode, select a portion of the hair which you want to weight paint. 
then go to select, select linked, and then click linked. This will highlight all the mesh connected to that portion. To see what you have selected, press H to hide the highlighted section. If you think you've missed a spot, hold shift and highlight more portions, and then do a link select again. To separate the mesh so it becomes its own object, right click, go to separate, and click on selection. To weight paint, select the armature, then select the hair. Go up to the corner and switch to weight paint mode. Select the gradient tool, then select one of the hair bones. Set the strength to 1 and the weights to 1. Remember, red means maximum pressure and blue means zero pressure. Apply the weight paint to the section which the bone covers. Also, make sure the scalp has a blue section where the hair parts, as that will be the pivot point of the hair. Make sure weights don't bleed onto the other side. Right click and set the weights to zero so you can make corrections when needed. To weight paint another object, go back to object mode and select the armature. Then select the new object. Now return to weight paint mode. Again, apply the weight paint and make sure the scalp has little to no pressure. Once the hair is weight painted, we will need to stress test it to make sure everything is warping correctly. Either in pose mode or weight paint mode, select a bone and rotate it. You may notice that the hair won't follow the bones exactly. This is because the anchor bone is putting pressure on the entire hair, which is causing the bones to be slightly out of sync. Make corrections when you find issues with the weights. If you find that objects are blocking the gradient tool, use the paintbrush instead. For a better view, isolate the hair. By default, this is the slash key. This will help you find excess weight paint much more easily. To reset the hair, select all the hair bones, then right click and select Clear User Transforms. Now, if you want to create a pivot point inside one of the bones, then go to Edit Mode, select the bone, and right click. Select Subdivide, that will add a joint in the middle of the bone. Select that lower bone, then right click and select Split. This will separate the bone from the main bone. In weight paint mode, select the top bone and clear the weights from the bottom. Then, select the bottom bone and reapply weights to that spot. Lastly, in edit mode, select the bottom bone and parent it to the top bone. Now we can pose the hair so it appears to be resting on the character's shoulders. We can repeat these same actions for some other bones on the hair if you want to style it in a certain way. For example, I added a joint bone to this segment of the hair behind the fringe, so I could position it so it's behind the character's shoulder. Once you have split several other hair bones, you can start doing some more advanced stress testing by posing the hair and lighting it. When you're done stress testing, go into the Bone Data tab and give all the hair bones you have created a simple name for organization. Now let's say hypothetically, mid-project, you wanted to replace the hair. So first, go into DAS and pick your new hair asset or pose. Then save a separate DAS scene and Diffio script. Import your character into Blender without any diffeomorphic settings. Select and copy the new hair object. You don't need to save this blend file when you exit. Return to your original blend scene. If you're using the same hair asset, just in a different pose, then create two collections. One for the hair cap, which we will be reusing, and the other for the new hair mesh. If you're using completely different hair assets, then you'll only need one collection. Hide the original hair collection, then select the collection and paste. In edit mode, delete the head cap, then remove the head cap material from the object. Next, swap out the materials so Avian's hair material is being used and any duplicates have been replaced. Unparent the hair from the armature and then delete that armature. Purge your blender scene of any excess data. Next, parent your hair to the character's rig and set the armature modifier to use your character's rig. Lastly, delete all the vertex groups for the hair. Now we have a clean slate to weight paint. To save time, let's transfer the weights from our original hair onto the new hair. First, unhide the collection containing the original hair. Select the original hair object, then select the new hair object, so it's highlighted yellow. Go to weight paint mode and select transfer weights, and set the source layers to by name. Now when you pose the bones, you can see that the new hair can now be posed. The only issue is that the weight paint is in different areas and the bones are not aligned. Select each bone and remove the excess weights. 
Make sure the scalp has blue spots where the hair parts. When you're done, go into cycles mode and check to see if there are any issues. Now if you want to reposition the hair bones for your new hair, then follow these steps. In edit mode, go to the bone collections and click the hair layer, then click select. That will highlight all the hair bones in that layer. Right click and duplicate, then press ESC. In the bone collections with the hair layer selected, click remove. Click the plus button. Now name the new collection after your new hair asset. Select the new bone layer and click assign. Now we have two versions of our hair bones. Reposition each bone so they line up with each portion of the new hair. Now go into the bone data tab and give all the new bones which we have just posed a subtitle related to your new hair asset. Then, in the Posed Hairs Vertex groups, give that same subtitle to all the bones in that window. That will transfer control of the weights from the original bones to the new posed bones. Do some last minute cleanup of the weights. When you feel satisfied, you will now have a fully rigged alternative version of your new hair. Now that's enough editing, let's now actually render this thing. Make sure you're using a high resolution and a high sample rate to get the greatest amount of detail possible within your performance limitations. Next, make sure the light path settings, including transparency, are set to a high value. Depending on the density of your hair, the transparency should be set to 100 at its lowest and up to 500 at its highest if you don't want to see black spots in your hair. This will cause the biggest performance hit to your render. Now, let's do a render. When it's complete, you will find that the hair in your result is quite noisy. To fix this, we need to go into the compositor. In there, connect the Kurohara and anti-aliasing nodes to the output. You will see that the Kurohara node does a good job at smoothing over that noise. So I recommend you save several different render results, first being the clean version, then several more with different Kurohara strengths. You can name these however you want. In my instance, I marked mine with the Kurohara settings being used. Next, I drop them all into Photoshop. Keep the clean version at the bottom and put the different Kurohara renders at the top. Then add a black mask to those layers, and with a white brush, you can reveal sections of the Kurohara filter on top of the clean render, so we can smooth out the hair and remove noise while keeping the face clean. We can mix different Kurohara renders together as well for different results. Feel free to experiment with different renders and masks to see what results you can create. Lastly, if you want to bring back some of the noise to give off a subtle sparkling effect, then put all the Kurohara renders into a group, and then lower the opacity of that group so the clean render fades back in. If you want to brighten up your render, add in a vibrance and brightness adjustment layer so you can increase your render's overall values. If you see any artifacts in your hair, you can use the stamp brush to cover them up, or a little bit of paint over work. You can also do a copy merge to overlay a piece of hair on top of your paint over to make sure the covered area is less obvious. Either way, I'm finally done. I hope this helps you get a great result for your Daz character's hair in Blender. Stay tuned, as my next tutorial will be on how to use the Global Skin add-on. So again, make sure to like and subscribe.